Hey everybody, this is Dr. Armstrad coming back at you with another video. This one is a part one of a four part series examining why states decide to purchase arms. This is part one reviewing the strategic functional theory of arms procurement. Now the strategic functional theories of arms procurement is going to be one of four uh, theory blocks that explain arms transfer behavior or arms procurement behavior, sorry. And the reason why I separate it out into the four blocks here is because this is probably the most simplistic way that I can explain the arms procurement behavior of states. So again, the first one that we're going to go over here today is the uh, strategic functional theories and their approach to arms procurement behavior, but there's three others. The second one is going to be the factional theory of arms procurement behavior. The third is going to be the geopolitical explanations or theories explaining why states procure arms. And then the last one, which is probably my favorite, is going to be the institutional or normative theory of arms procurement behavior. So anyway, let's go ahead and dive right into these strategic functional theories and how they explain why states decide to procure arms. Strategic functional theories of arms procurement behavior are going to be by far the most common theories that you're going to see that try to explain arms procurement behavior. The majority of your international relations literature, especially within the uh, realist scholarship, is going to tend to center around strategic functional approaches to arms procurement. The reason for that is strategic functional approaches to arms procurement are nested within rational choice theory. What does that mean? Well, essentially, strategic functional approaches to arms procurement behavior use rational choice theory to basically say that the only reason why states purchase arms is because they face some sort of threat. So they're purchasing arms for the security of the state. It, again, it's going to be based on rational choice, but it, it's not that they purchase arms based on security. It's that they also select weapons based upon the level of threat they face and also their budget, which seems to make sense, right? If we think about it more of an individual mindset, if you feel threatened yourself, then you're going to go out to the gun store and you're going to purchase a gun, but you're also not going to purchase the most expensive gun. You're going to probably buy one that's well within your budget. So the reason why it's probably the most popular is because it's simple and it tends to make intuitive sense. If the strategic functional theories still kind of confuse you, probably the most succinct explanation that I've found comes from Alice and Morris in their 1975 book, where they say that weapons are the result of national strategic choice. Government leaders select specific weapons and total force posture on the basis of precise calculations about national objectives, perceived threats, and strategic doctrine within the constraint of technology and budget. What they're basically saying is that states will buy arms because they feel that there is a threat there. And when they do purchase arms, they're going to make sure that it fits within the budget. And that kind of sums up these strategic functional theories. It's all nested around rational choice. Now, the pros to this theory are that it's probably the most common theory that you can find out there. And there's a reason for that, because it's pretty simple. The explanation is intuitive. It talks about only purchasing arms if you face a threat. Then it says that you should only buy arms that's within your budget. That all intuitively tends to make sense. So it's based on rational choice and then a part of microeconomic calculus as well. So it's saying that you probably shouldn't go over your budget. It's obvious. Weapons procurement is driven by security needs. That just seems obvious. That's the good pro about this, is it usually tends to make sense to most people without a whole lot of explanation. And international relations lit literature, especially on arms race behavior, uh, is littered with the strategic functional approach or, or theories to explain arms procurement behavior. And we should also probably note that there's also a lot of support out there for strategic functional theories. If we look at the arms race literature, it's going to say that most states procure arms because they feel some sort of threat next to their border. And that research tends to bore out. India tends to arm itself when Pakistan arms itself and vice versa. We also tend to find that when we look at the conflict literature as well, that states tend to arm before they go into conflict. But although it seems that the strategic functional theories of arms procurement seem pretty obvious and there is support for them, there's also a lot of problems in the theories as well. One of the biggest cons to the strategic functional approach or the strategic functional theories of arms procurement behavior is the fact that 
It's based on rational choice, and it's so simple. When we get down to it, the international state system is fundamentally socially constructed. And as we find in our everyday lives, rational choice doesn't tend to govern everything in which we do. It assumes that weapons procurement is going to be closely linked to the level of military threat. But we find that arms procurement has stayed pretty stable and actually risen over the past 50 years, even though the number of conflicts has actually decreased. How do we explain that type of behavior? If we also look at states that don't face any type of threats within their region, like Peru or Uganda, it's a little bit difficult to explain why they decide to buy state-of-the-art fighter planes like the MiG-29 and the SU-30 using strategic functional theories of arms procurement. So although strategic functional theories of arms procurement are at least seem intuitive and obvious, there is holes in explaining arms procurement behavior around the globe. Uh, Lastly, the strategic functional theories tend to assume that we can control proliferation by elevating the costs of procurement through things like embargoes or reducing the benefits, like how we work the nuclear proliferation treaty, or we could address the underlying security needs of states, things like the nuclear-free zones. But as we found throughout the last 50 years, even using these three different methods of trying to control proliferation, procurement and proliferation of arms has, again, stayed pretty steady for the past 50 odd years. So strategic functional theories tend to kind of break down. Now, before I close up the video, I want to tell you a story that kind of pokes a huge hole in the strategic functional theories of arms procurement behavior. Remember that I said that strategic functional theories tend to focus on a rational choice when they procure arms, and part of the rational choice is that they're going to purchase arms based on costs too. If they can afford it, then they're going to buy it, and if they can't afford it, they probably aren't going to buy it. In the 1970s, the U.S. government put a lot of money into the F-20 fighter plane, which was marketed as a low-cost, low-maintenance fighter plane that the U.S. was going to export to its allies. Northrop Grumman thought that it was going to be a huge success because if we think about it in rational terms, the fact that we're producing an advanced fighter on the cheap it should probably sell a lot, especially when I don't really have to work on it or worry about it as much as I would if I bought a state to the art plane like the F-16 at that point in time. Unfortunately for the F-20, it was a huge flop. What we actually found was that the export market for the F-20 wasn't really there. That's the problem with the strategic functional approach. There were states that really needed planes and really needed arms, but they weren't going to buy the F-20. Instead, you saw states actually opt in for the F-16, which was more expensive and more maintenance intensive than the F-20 was. So rational choice would say that you probably should have picked the F-20. But the F-16 is around today, still being produced, and the F-20 is pretty much only in museums at this point. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, go ahead and click the like button or subscribe. And please join me for part two, reviewing the factional theory of arms procurement behavior. I will talk to all of you guys later.